More importantly, this is one of the biggest wealth shifts in our lifetime. And so if we do not have a chance to, if we don't actually rather learn the information, we'll miss the train again. And so I just searched, searched, searched. I couldn't find it. And I said, well, you know, I have one or two options. I either just wait for somebody else to build it um, or God said, no, you're going to build it. And I said, OK, so <laughs> that's how that started. It was literally a, a solution to what I did not see in the marketplace, which is black and brown representation, specifically around these topics. Welcome to the Marketing for the Culture podcast, powered by the African-American Marketing Association. Each week, we'll bring you an insightful conversation from some of the best experts in our industry on how to advance our career. Join the collective of Black marketers across the world advancing their brand as we work towards creating a collaborative community. And welcome to another edition of Marketing for the Culture. I'm your host and podcast producer, C.L. Palmer, a.k.a. CZ Pie Gang. And today, I've got a very special guest on the podcast, another one of the presenters from the Marketing for the Culture Summit this May 12th. It is none other than Miss Tina Bonner from Black and Meta. How you doing today, Miss Tina? Hey, what's happening? What's happening? So good to see you, man. Excited to be on here today. Uh, We're going to do some things for the culture, so let's do it. And I'm with that. And I'm already loving the energy. You know, you, you, you seem like you actually ready. (laughs) <laughs> to be on camera and, and do some things. And shouts out to you for that. Yes, yes. I'm excited. I love this. I love sharing. I love providing information. Anything I can do to push the culture, I'm here. So when I got the email, I'm like, say less. I'm there. Let's get it on the calendar and make it happen. That's what's up. So I want to just let people get to know you first before we get into the all nitty gritty. So if you could tell me kind of who is... Tina Bonner, and why is it important that I know her? Uh huh. Such a loaded question. That when you ask it like that, I got to come up with some heat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who am I? You know, to be honest with you, I am a trailblazer. That is what I do, and mm. I trailblaze paths so that people of color. Um, can come behind and don't have to go through all of the mud and the guck. And I do that, uh, have done that for the last decade. That is what I do. And I'm now considered an award-winning entrepreneur. I am a certified coach, uh, both high-performance coach as well as a functional medicine coach. And so I use all of my talents and my skills that I've, I've learned and had the pleasure to coach with and be certified with to really be able to converge all of them together to build Mm. solutions uh, and build businesses that help push the culture forward. So that's what I do. That's who I am. Um, I'm excited to go first uh, and just happy to be able to go and and, and learn so that I can bring information back to our culture and our community. And so I know we'll get into Black and Meta and just a few, but um, more importantly, my work right now is built around technology as well as the metaverse specifically, Web3 specifically, and leveraging those platforms to be able to move the culture. Mm. So, yeah, we, we definitely going to get into the metaverse. You know, I got some questions. I'm, I'm a little uh, meta curious. We'll put it like that. <laughs> I like you know, how you I say have, that. You know, I haven't quite made the jump in, but I'm, I'm seeing things. I'm like, hmm, I might want to get involved. So, yeah, we definitely going to get into that. But you hit something that really struck my ears. And you said um, you consider yourself a trailblazer. And one of the things that is required to be a trailblazer is to go into the unknown. Mm-hmm. And that's a brave thing to do. And I feel like a lot of people are afraid to just really jump into the unknown. So my question would be, um, where where does that that sense of being comfortable with the unknown come from? Uh, such a good question. I, it's, it really, I have to give some credit to who I am by design. Um, I am a trailblazer by nature. That is something that I have just been literally my parents curated to me to for me to be such and so I have to give it back and credit to my family and how they've designed me to be and it really does matter you know how you are as a young child as a young child I was put into everything from taekwondo and got my black belt all the way into the other side of creativity uh, a group called odyssey of the mind where they would literally just give us things and we had to come up and create things out of nothing and so I've been on these opposite end of the spectrums between being 
an athlete and then being a creative and then joining the debate team and all of these things that I was always in the unknown. And my parents were like, no, you're going to do this and then you're going to try this. And then by default, I built the, the idea of curiosity. Like curiosity became something that was ingrained in me just because I had to go in all of these spaces. And so part of it was design. And after you do things long enough, C.O. Palmer, after you do a lot of the stuff that you don't know how to do long enough, you realize that it's not that scary. <laughs> so for me, it was like every, every year it felt like I had to learn something new and something different. And uh, after a while I was like, wow, it's always gonna be scary at the beginning but it gets better. It just, just hang in there. It gets better. And so by the time I now be being an adult, it's just that same essence, holding on to the idea that it's always going to be scary. Yes, this is a little bit different because I'm going into a space where there is no, no pavement yet. Nothing has been passed. The trees are still like, literally envision a forest where you have to walk through and nothing has been paved. Right. But the reality mm -hmm. is that if you do it and hang in there long enough, it'll the trees will start to bend and, and move out of your way because you're doing the hard thing. And so. That's just kind of where I live at now. I know that it always is going to get better. You just got to keep knocking down the trees. Mm, I like that. Knock, knock them trees down. Make, make that path yeah. so you can get to where you need to get to. Oh, man. You, I, I, I'm a big fan of that. And I know it's something I'm working on with my kids, trying to get them to be more well-rounded and, and really get exposed to a lot of different things just so they can, like you said, like you had the athletic, you had the debate team. And that, that type of stuff is important because it's important to work your mind just as much as it is to work your body. Yeah. And I, I'm seeing it paying dividends looking at you right now. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a good job uh, by your parents putting you in those situations. Um, so you said something, too, and I'm, I want to get into a little bit about your coaching. Um, but before that, I want to ask you like about the process. And it seems the way you describe going through things is you're the type of person who loves the process. Yeah. And we recently had um, author Henry Adasso. He came on and his whole mantra is like process over results. So wh where do you fit on that side of the equation? I you're reading me. So shout out to you for being a great podcast host <laughs> because it's so true. I absolutely love the process. I do. Um, if you look over here, you know, my, I'm looking at all of my books. I have a library here and all of them for the most part, with the exception of a few are personal development books. And it's because I believe so much of, of being able to extrapolate not only just lessons, but insight, uh, people, right? We forget all of the things that we we gather and gain by going through a season of our life. And sometimes we look at the target to say, you know, did I check off the thing that I wanted to check off instead of seeing it as what did I collect before I get ready to pass go again? Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many things that we collect in a season. And even if the season isn't the best, right, I'll be very transparent over the last just few months uh, coming out of the pandemic, I've been transitioning out of just the things that were for the last year and a half and now going into a new season of the things that are different. And a lot of what I'm able to like pull from is knowing that like, wow, look at all of the, the, the lessons, the grit, um, the, right. the even just like I said, the people, people are such destiny triggers, like meeting new people and running into new people and just thinking about all of the conversations that I've had, all of the things that I've learned about myself, even the the skills that I didn't know I had that emerged through the through the depths of like deep darkness. Right. And when mm. I say darkness, I just mean just like tough times. Right. Right. So. I love the process because without it, you aren't able to collect what, what I call like these stones and these gems that you can put on your crown. Right. And say, hey, yeah, I went through that and this is that battle scar. And now I've got the gem uh, to prove it and, and certify myself in those ways because the lessons come back up. And if you don't get it the first time, listen, it's coming back around. <laughs> so that's to make sure that you get it. <laughs> so I, I love the process um, so much that we can expunge from that. 
Yes, I, I'm a big fan of the process myself. So that's that's why I was able to read you so well because it kind of sounded like something I would have said myself. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I can identify with that. So yes, um, no, but I love that you 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 laid it out um, because you're definitely going to have to go through things, and the fact that if you don't take what what was most valuable of the experience then you're not able to grow inside of that process. Yeah. So, I, oh man, I love that sentiment. See, it's, see it's, not- it's so much I can say about the process, but I'll, I'll, I'll share this and for the listeners. You know, one thing that has helped me remember and to keep the processes in mind is that everything is happening for me and not to me. Everything is happening uh-huh. for me and not to me. And so seeing and reframing my lens like that helps me be able to say, okay, this thing happened that didn't on the surface does not seem like it was advantageous or doesn't seem like it went well. But because I know things are happening for me, what happened and why does that create that scenario created and what am I supposed to get from it? Because everything's happening for me. Right. And so when we can see it that way, it just also makes the process that much more digestible. And uh, I think it's needed for us to have those practical tips on how we can actually implement this concept. And uh, that's been super helpful for me. So I wanted to share that. Uh, so. So basically now we're talking mindset. So I guess we need to start talking about coaching <laughs> because this this is this is also kind of my lane too. I'm not a coach myself, but I'm really into mindset and yeah. the ability that it has to push you where you need to be. And I guess I want to know from you just kind of like how you got into coaching um and and I guess what is your mindset uh when when it comes to approaching like coaching an individual so my mindset is that the person that i'm coaching has everything that they already need right and that's the beautiful thing is that as humans we come to the table with everything that we already need right you're just as powerful as the coach that's coaching you and so it's so important as we go in and whether it's a coach or a therapist or a consultant the reality is that we all hold the same power my coach gave me a, a mantra and i say this every single morning it says i'm above no one and i'm below no one I'm above no one and I'm below no one. And and when we understand that, it allows us to see that just because this person is in the seat, coaching me does not necessarily mean that they are better than me. What it means is that they have some tools and some strategies to help me navigate where I am that I may not have present in my back pocket right now. And so I Mm. love coaching because it's not about, you know, having someone and telling them what to do. My job as a coach is to use the tools and strategies that I have, understanding psychology and understand just the human nature and behavior to help that person navigate where they are and how to get from point A to point Z. So that's why I love coaching, because it's literally just the tools and strategies to be able to do that. Um, And so I got into coaching because I was tired, to be honest with you, of just it's it's two reasons. But the main reason I found it fell into my lap. But I decided to actually pursue the coaching art because I realized is that, you know, I want to be able able to have this information as a trailblazer, but not tell people what to do, not tell people that they must do this, but have strategies to say, hey, this is something that is could be advantageous for you. And here's how you actually leverage it to get from point A to point Z. And knowing that we all are different, we all have different backgrounds. It was important to me to have some tools and some strategies that whether I'm coaching somebody in you know Zimbabwe or coaching somebody, you know, out in New Orleans, right? It doesn't matter to me. It was it was having this, the tools and the strategy to be able to help somebody get from point A to point Z. Because what good is trailblazing if you can't bring people with you? True. This is so true. <laughs> God, to, but we we talk about this in the community a lot, and it, it it would be great if everybody could subscribe to that same mindset. You know, I'm, I'm gonna just leave it right there. Uh, <laughs> But that 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 is pretty dope, and I, I know myself. I'm like I'm like I probably need to coach myself because I, I got some. I know I got some things I need to get worked out. But um, <laughs> I, I'm I guess I'm gonna cross that bridge very soon. Um, what? Well, it's, it's just so much I could go into. But I want to, I guess, talk a little bit about your coaching techniques, and then we will get into um, black and meta. So. What what's one of the most common hurdles 
you see people have for themselves when they sit down with you for the first time? One thousand percent. The most common hurdle I see is belief, belief, belief in themselves and belief that what they actually really want, they deserve it. You have to believe. If you don't believe, it doesn't matter what I tell you. It doesn't matter what you tell yourself. If you truly don't believe, it does not matter. Uh, one of the, the, the things that we talk about a lot, a lot in my peak performance training, and the concept of peak performance is literally helping someone al- unlock the best version of themselves so that they can show oh. up in work, they can show up at home, and they can show up in every other facet of their life, literally being their best self, right? And even when they're not their best self, they have a strategy to get back there. That's the key, right? It's not knowing how how to get back there when you're burnt out, when you're stressed, when you're overwhelmed. So I teach my my clients a system and a strategy to be able to get back there, even if they're not there currently, right? But this concept, though, of, of really understanding, you know, I've got to believe that I am the person that can actually do the job, right? I've got to believe that there's nobody above me and that there's no one below me. If I don't believe that, then it doesn't matter. And so he talked about C.L. Palmer, the, the idea of this mindset. And it's true because as a peak performance coach, I see it all the time. Just people can literally trick their brains to think that they are inferior. And, you know, on mm. the other side, you can trick your brain to think that you're something and so much bigger or have so much more skill sets than you really don't. Right. So there's a concept that I want to share that has been really pivotal in my coaching um, career, but also pivotal in my clients is realizing that this concept of right. neutral and uh, rest in peace to Trevor Moad. He's one of the best mental coaches, was one of the best mental coaches um, in the game. And he recently passed, but he wrote a book um, called Getting to Neutral. And the foreword is actually written by uh, Russell Wilson. And he talks about this concept of neutral. Go ahead. You want to say something? I was going to say it's like that I heard about that concept and it was with the guy who was with Russell Wilson. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, is that the same guy? I mean, they were like peas in a pod. So it was, it was probably Trevor Moed. And, um, but this concept of neutral is, is the idea of like, you know, it's not about pumping yourself up. And sometimes we think that if we just say these affirmations in the morning, like I'm the best, I'm this, I'm that, right. We call it that the positive, uh, toxic positivity. Right. Right. It's not just about pumping yourself up. Excuse me. And it's not just about just kind of being so humble that you don't give yourself the recognition that you deserve. Um, It's really about being neutral and saying what's true, what's facts, um, and then leaning into what that is. So I can go on and on about that. But those are some of the strategies. And really what I see is belief. And one way to really be able to create more belief in your life is to create neutral statements um, and get back to neutral. So I would recommend that book for anybody who's, who's challenged with that. I, I keep saying I'm going to get my hands on that book. It's kind of one of those things because I heard him talk on a podcast about that. And I was like, that's actually a really good point because not everything is positive. Yeah. You know, you can you can change your perception about a lot of things. But if something is just negative, it's like it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And you just have to deal with that. So that I'm going to second that recommendation and I'm going to take you up on it as well. Let, let me know how it works. Let me. That's one of my favorites. Uh, I, that one, it takes what it takes. Um, and then another one is The Confident Mind by Dr. Nate Zinzer. Those are my three like go tos as it relates to mindset, um, belief, and just getting it done. Man, that's dope. That's that's dope. I, I'm gonna have to. You're gonna have to go ahead and, and shoot me an email with those. So <laughs> okay. I, don't forget. I know I can play it back, but it's not the same. It's just like, all right, I could Google that thing. Yeah. Make sure I got the right one. Uh, but okay, so tell me this: uh, when when you do come across somebody who's might have the belief, or you're still struggling with it, but you notice that there's there's something like in their personal life that's troubling. You know, people got you know bad relationships, you know, jobs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, relationship with their kids, parents. Like people have all type of personal issues that hold them back so like how how do you enter the space of being able to help them deal with some of those personal hurdles 
Oh, man, this is a tough one, right? And, and I'll be honest, I don't always have the answers for every personal situation. One of the things I love about coaching is that um, you don't necessarily have to be in somebody's direct shoes, right, to be able to guide them. However, I do think experience is, is great, which is like for somebody like me, I don't have children. So coaching a personal uh, challenge in, re- in regards to children may be a specific uh, challenge for me or more of a challenge for me than a coach who doesn't. And so I think what's really important is just like, you know, people find different people, whether it be a, you know, a therapist, a consultant, business consultant, different groups they want to work with, right? You really have to find somebody that is matched up with what you need in your life for the challenges that you have. And so, like you said, if you, if belief is checked off, then it comes down to strategy, right? Practicality. And that's just a, a process of elimination to figure out what's everything on my plate right now. What are the personal challenges that I'm dealing with that are like self-inflicted, meaning like the things that I've actually created or or I'm enabling, right? And then the other side is what are the things that are happening that are, to your point, just are what they are. And we've got to navigate that and we've got to just be in it right now and then look at the outsides of, okay, if this is the thing that's, that's just is what it is and I can't change it, right? I love the serenity prayer. Like we're going to accept the things that we can't change and have courage to change the things we can't. But if this is one of those things that we just can't change, then what are the things that we can change? And you work on those things. And so I can guarantee anybody listening right now, 100% of the things in your life are not unchangeable. There's only a handful that are unchangeable. The other stuff is changeable. And it's just about us taking time to sit down and identifying all of the things in our lives and then sitting with it so that we can navigate and understand my coach always tells me when I went through my peak performance training, like our brains are great at processing information, terrible at holding information. So if we just hold mm-hmm. all of this stuff in our head, we'll have this perception that it's so much and it's actually going to overwhelm us and all this stuff. The minute that you pull out the piece of paper and decide, OK, today is going to be the day that I write down everything that's happening in my life. And then I can go through and ask myself, is this one changeable? Is this one changeable? Is this one changeable? Is this one changeable? Then from there, you've got a strategy. Now you know how to move. And so the first start is just saying, hey, let me figure out what I can change and what I can't. For everything else that I can't change, right, I just will deal with it and accept it and move on with the other things. Life is not easy. It's never going to be perfect. But my hope is that these particular strategies help us navigate a little bit easier um, so that we can get through to the next season because joy always comes Uh in the morning. Absolutely. Very well said. I hope everybody out there finishes up with this podcast and gets a piece of paper (laughs) and writes down everything you could change and what you can't change. And I think everybody should have one of those lists because it's going to allow you to have some real perspective. And man, I just appreciate you for saying that, Tina. It, man, I could I could do this this mindset stuff all day. Like I really <laughs> do. I ain't gonna lie to you. I just it's been I, I love this stuff because I wish I knew some of this stuff, especially growing up. You know, in, yes. in my early twenties. You know, like everything in your twenties, and especially even pretty much before that. It's like a big deal. You think everything is a big deal. Everything in the world is falling apart. Every, I mean, we just take so much stuff out of context, but really it's our lack of strategy. It's our lack of strategy on how to get through the thing that makes it feel like it's a big deal. The reality is going through stuff is not a big deal. We all have to go through life, right? Life isn't going to life. It's going to life us because that's what life does. The reason why we feel overwhelmed is because we don't have strategy for what we're going through and we don't have perspective on how to sit in like where we are and then like not be crushed by what we've been through, but then hold on to where we're going all at the same time. And when we don't have strategy for that, we get crushed by the now. So I could talk about this stuff all day long. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I want to say something, but I want I got to move on because okay. I want to talk about Black and Matter. Yes. And so we have Web 3.0. We got, you know, cryptocurrencies going crazy. Yeah. NFTs, uh, JPEGs and tweets. And then we got this metaverse thing. And right now, Mark Zuckerberg is trying to own the thing. <laughs> And and now we got Black in Meta. So tell me, Tina, what's what is Black in Meta, and why is it important that it exists? 
Yeah, yeah, so so good. Um, Black and Meta really found me, if I could be honest with you. I had no intentions to build a second tech company. I built my first tech company in 2013, um, and that company did really well, and it ended up getting acquired by another company. And you know, I went through some some transition between then um, and then finding my coaching route. And so that was kind of the second or third iteration of my life was finding my my passion for coaching. And so. I'm deep here. I am CL Palmer deep inside of my coaching practice. I'm, I'm dealing with clients every day, having the conversations like we're having right now, helping them build belief and helping them do all the things. And out of nowhere drops in my lap, web 3.0 in the metaverse. And the reality is, is because I'm a trailblazer, I always look for new ways to be able to pull the culture forward. That is just who I am. And part of my assignment on this earth is to be able to pull the culture forward. And so when I saw it, I looked for it first. I looked for specifically black and brown representation inside of the metaverse, not because I wanted to create black and meta, but because I wanted to join wherever the community was because I was trying to learn too. So after oh. like weeks of searching and searching, I could not find any representation. I mean, not say any, but it was very little representation. It was like a TikTok video here, a YouTube video here, and every 90% of the rest of the content was by other people that were not black or especially not people of color. It was white males, you know, teenagers, whatever the case may be. And I was like, man, this is tough because while I may understand it a little bit, people who aren't tech savvy, mind you, I'm coming from a tech background prior to coaching, is going to go over their head. More importantly, this is one of the biggest wealth shifts in our lifetime. And so we do not have a chance to, if we don't actually rather learn the information, we'll miss the train again. And so I just searched, searched, searched. I couldn't find it. And I said, well, you know, I have one or two options. I either just wait for somebody else to build it um, or God said, no, you're going to build it. And I said, OK, so <laughs> that's how that started. It was literally a, a solution to what I did not see in the marketplace, which is black and brown representation specifically around these topics. And so um, it started out as, as something else. It wasn't even the name wasn't even black and meta at first. It was something else. And, you know, went through a couple of iterations and I'm just, you know, after hours, I've still got my coaching clients. I still got my other businesses. But after hours, I'm just tinkering and learning. And, uh, you know, after what, 30 days of, of pulling together the branding and the name change and everything else, we officially launched. And within 45 days time, we had crossed over 3 million views, uh, had the content had been shared on Afrotech and, you know, a bunch of other platforms. I mean, it just was out of the water of what we expected. Um, and so, yeah, I've got to give a huge shout out to to my marketing director, Danielle McEwen, because she's been the backbone to making sure that we've been able to get the visibility um, that we deserve. But uh, that's how it started. That's how it started. And uh, I'm just excited to see what happens next. OK, so you say you had a tech company before Black and Meta. Mm -hmm. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that and how did that inform the way you moved into putting together Black and Meta? So technology has always been a part of my my ethos. Like to, it's always been a part of my movement rather. Um, my ethos behind my technology is being able to create human-centered experiences specifically for black and brown people, right? And so when I first started my company, it was an agency. It was a digital app de a development agency. And we built digital apps, websites, all of that. And back early in 2013, like Instagram, to put it in context, Instagram really started in 2011, 2012. That's when that took off. So I created my agency in 2013. 13. So this is really early on through web two, social media, et cetera. And at the time, apps were like the hottest thing out. It was like, this is what you do. If you want to be popping, you build an app for yourself. So we were building apps for small businesses, uh, DJs, restaurants, you know, festivals, et cetera. And so that written really well. And what it did was it helped me understand how technology is such a, a, a gateway and a bridge between getting somewhere faster. And that's what this is about. It's about getting somewhere faster. My, my love and my passion for Web3 and, and NFTs and metaverse it's not because I'm so obsessed with NFTs. I see it as a bridge and a pathway for us to do something so much faster, which in this case is build wealth, right? Which is in this case, create our own communities, which is in this case, own our own IP, 
right? That's what this is about. So it's not about technology itself. It's about what it can do for us. And so that's my passion for Black and Meta is creating more understanding around the ecosystem of this stuff. Because when you understand it, then the light bulb goes off on why it's so important. Because for the first time in the history of America, we're dealing with what we call decentralized platforms, which means that there is no Facebook or there is no um, big companies or what should I say, being able to control um, the details, right? And granted, when I say a Facebook or Meta, I am not saying at all that those aren't great companies. I think we all, all companies have their issues and their challenges. But what I'm saying is though, is that even those particular companies are designing this new Web3 in efforts to be able to give content and IP and control back to the creators. And that has never been an agenda, right? And so um, that's why I'm passionate. That's why I'm passionate because we get a chance as black people and people of color, we get a do-over. We really get a do-over in a way that we've never seen it before. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited to be in this space. Okay. So, you, so you're looking at being black, in the metaverse as an opportunity for for basically new growth within the black community and what would you say to people that might push back on that and be like this is kind of a fad it's just kind of trendy um you know there's some things out there it's just going to kind of be like for tech nerds (laughs) you know like well how do you handle some of that type of pushback because i know how we talk Yeah. So I love this question because you're absolutely right. There's the pushback a thousand percent. Um, It doesn't mean everybody, but there is absolutely pushback around this content, around Web3, around the metaverse. My response to pushback uh, in the words of the infamous and legendary Lil Wayne, men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. (laughs) And uh, what we can see is it's really about the trends. This is about data. If we look back at the last two decades of technology, like I said, it's now 2022. When did Facebook start or when did Instagram kick off? 2012, 10 years before that, right? 10 years before that, 1992. What are we looking at? AOL, right? Dial up internet. So it's less about my opinion. It's less about JoJo's opinion and whoever's opinion, it's more about statistical data and trends of this is by default the next iteration of the internet, not because we want it to be, but because it's time, because the data and the trends are showing so. And so... I look at it as, um, you know, really understanding and and doing your homework on um, conceptually how this stuff is like moving. Um, And then you just let the history show you. And then if you don't, you know, see it, that's fine, too. It's really not my goal with Black and Meta is not to convince people. It's to give them the information and let them do what they do. Right. I think they say you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. Right. So my job is not to make people drink, but it's to create a clear pathway to where the water is. The problem is, is when you don't know the water is there, so you don't even have the opportunity to drink. Right. So that's my job is to create a pathway to say, hey, everybody, there's water over here. Now, whether you decide to drink or not, it's up to you. Um, But so too much, too many times black and brown people don't even know there's a water. There's a well over there. And so we can't even take a part or participate. And uh, we got to change that. That's what I'm talking about, you know, really out here trying to change y'all and, and keep y'all from being so thirsty. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of thirsty people out there on Instagram. And Tina is telling you, you can get with this metaverse and you don't have to be thirsty no more. You can go ahead and, <laughs> and have at it. So tell me of the people who are drinking the water already, what Who or what are you seeing that's really cool and has grabbed your attention in the metaverse? It's, you know, of course, black, black and brown people, of course. But yeah, or just across the board. Yeah, so many ways to approach the metaverse. And what's really important is to see this as an ecosystem. 
right? So just like the internet, I think the best way I can really, really explain this to people so they can get it is that like the internet in 2010, right? 10 years ago, like it had really kind of started to solidify of, okay, we've got high speed internet. Now we can do some other things from YouTube to Instagram, et cetera. But there were so many different pieces of the ecosystem, right? It wasn't just one Instagram platform. It was Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, right? So you got all the social media pieces. And then you've got like the back end stuff, which is like WordPress, Shopify, like like the actual website pieces. So that's that. Then you have the people that are inside of the websites or on the websites rather. And then those are what the influencers and the, the brands and they got LinkedIn, which is showing more corporate and sponsored. So what's really important is to see this as an ecosystem, because when you see it as an ecosystem, you can open up your mind to then begin to find your place. So it's not just about putting on a virtual reality headset, right? Maybe you, ne- maybe you never put on a headset, but you just want to be the person that understands the mechanics of it and starts to build games or starts to, to help share this information or broker deals and sponsorships with companies that do want to create headset to the community or to the specific other place, right? The idea here is less about a virtual reality headset and putting it on and hanging out in a virtual world so you can have this old alternative life, right? It's not about that. It's about the entire ecosystem of the internet is changing. Where is my place in the change, right? Is it in the NFT space? Is it in the metaverse space? Is it in the, the, the more of the building and the creating? And once you can kind of get in and navigate all of the ecosystem, be a generalist first and then find your space specifically on how you want to move. Uh, I'll give you a prime example. Black and Meta started as an uh, educational space for NFTs, Metaverse and Web3 and, and you know, to an extent, some cryptocurrency. What we quickly realized was that our space was specifically the metaverse, right? The connections that happen inside of the metaverse. But we couldn't have figured that out had we not first kind of navigated and tinkered with a bunch of stuff. So um, some of my favorite projects kind of, you know, in the ecosystem that are happening, one was Nas's NFT. I love how Nas gave not just, you know, access to a bunch of cool things, but he also gave ownership. Right to his NFT, um, I love what what uh, Meta is doing with Horizon Worlds and in that particular space, allowing creators to not have to buy land, um, but they can just put their headset on and immediately create whatever they can think of. I've seen some black businesses in there that have like their virtual headquarters. And they have they literally have hours where they're in there. I mean, how many times do you get a chance to hang out with the CEO of a company or a business and ask them questions? And then they can take the headset off and go buy the information or buy the content or buy the product right there. Um, so I'm seeing some really cool stuff with that for creators and, and artists. I'm seeing some really awesome stuff in Spatial. Uh, spatial.io is their website and just being able to, to, to monetize their art and showcase their art. I mean, in, in ways that you wouldn't even believe, right? So the across the board, there's so many ways to get involved. Um, the key is just getting in and being able to like get your feet wet so you can find your space. That's what I always tell people. Get your feet wet so you can find your place. Man, that's that's really interesting that you mentioned Nas off rip because to me, that was one of the moments that made me realize like, oh, okay. So now it's time to have the creators let the fans have a stake in something successful. Yeah. Because it wasn't just any song. It was Ultra Black that was on his Grammy winning album. And anybody who bought that NFT, now you have a piece of a Grammy winning album. And I thought that was really dope. Yeah. You know, just the idea of it in general. Um, and then just to think about like, OK, what what is going to come next? And you, know, you just you hit on a lot of things. So I, I can't wait to see where this does go in the next few years, um, because like it's possibilities are, are truly endless. So I, I want to go ahead and 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 take you out on this. Um, so what what do you expect to see next or what? What's something that you look forward to doing in the metaverse? What I look forward to doing in the metaverse, um, and, and remember the metaverse is, there's virtual reality, 
right? Which is the headset. And then there's the metaverse. So the virtual reality is just a vehicle to the metaverse, but you can access the metaverse via iPhone, laptop, computer, virtual reality headset, et cetera, right? The difference, what changes is your level of immersion. So whether you're like on the mm-hmm. internet or in the internet depends on what device that you're using, okay? So that's gotcha. really important for the listeners to understand. So the metaverse piece is the actual interactions and engagement in life, what I consider duplicated, right, inside of the internet. And so what I'm most excited about, about the metaverse specifically, not necessarily virtual reality, but the metaverse specifically is when every business brand uh, place has a duplicate inside of the virtual worlds. I think it's going to be really exciting when we can go to Coachella inside of the metaverse, right? I think it's going to be really exciting when we can be able to go to, um, you know, let's just call it even down to hanging out with our friends, like this particular podcast, where it's going to be super exciting, where instead of me looking at you on a screen, I'm now in your studio, in the internet, and I can see you, I can feel you, I can touch you, and we can do the same things that we're doing right now, but it's that much more immersed, right? And disclaimer, is this ever going to be better than the physical world? Not for my my take, right? Like being able to sit with you right now, CEO Palmer, in the studio, feeling your energy is going to be like life changing, right? That's always going to be better. But I can promise you putting on a headset or virtual reality experience, right? Going into the metaverse or even looking at our avatars or whatever the case may be, we can touch, we can hang out, we can do the things is going to be better than the Zoom, is going to be better than Google Meets. It's, it's going to be 10 times more exciting than, than you know, FaceTime. So that's what I'm most excited about is being able to interact, engage, uh, transact, right? Some of the some places and people that I would never be able to go to or run into, I'm going to be able to experience. Um, and simply because these metaverse just ecosystems will be built up. So that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about that. Um, and I think it's coming faster faster than we think for sure mm. I, I need to go ahead and get on board you you kind of already got me convinced i ain't gonna front <laughs> but um maybe a lot of time for that so before i let you go um can you let everybody know or give them a little preview of what to expect from you at the marketing for the culture summit and it just let people know where to find you yeah. Yeah. Well, first, I've got to get back to you. I mean, you've been an amazing podcast host. So thank you thank so you. much. Um, as well as, you know, uh, everyone that's putting together the the conference. I know it's going to be absolutely amazing. I cannot wait to be there. Um, and just shout out to everyone listening who's going to be in attendance. You know, my for me, my, God, my job coming to the conference is literally to be a well of information. And so what people can expect is to, to know that there is no silly questions. There are no dumb questions. Any and everything that you want to know um, is, is available. Uh, the second thing is that if I don't know an answer, I will go find it for you. So I am not the one to, to say, hey, yeah, let me just try to pull something out and make it sound good. If I don't know, I'll tell you, you know what? It's a great question. I'm not sure, but I'll get back to you. I'm going to go find it. And so my hope is that, you know, when we when we do with, do the um, event, one is that you get some information, um, but one is that you get your information activated, which is being able to understand, at least on the service level, what these things are. But then when I say activate it, meaning that you get a chance to really see yourself in it. Um, and my hope is that through examples, I- I'm going to bring my headset so that you all can be able to touch it and feel it and maybe even have the opportunity to jump some of you all into the metaverse is what we call it um, for the first time and be able to experience it that this information will come to life because it can be scary sometimes. It's, I know it's new, it's different. Different people have different levels of comfort when it comes to technology and putting on a headset or not. But my hope is that you can be able to see yourself in it and find your place. Cause now you found your people, black and meta, right? You found your people, right. but my hope is that you all can find your place. So um, to jumpstart and kick off what you'll experience in Atlanta very soon, you can follow us at black and meta, just like it sounds. And then you can also follow me at Tina Bonner Live, T-I-N-A-B-O-N-N-E-R Live. No spaces, no underscores, a lot of scammers out there, but mine is just like it sounds, Tina Bonner Live. But um, I'll pass it back to you again. Super excited um, to connect. And uh, yeah, I'll see y'all in Atlanta. 
Thank you for listening to Marketing for the Culture podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe, whether it's on Apple, Google, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And of course, our videos are on YouTube. If you have a moment, feel free to give us a rate, review, or just comment. We appreciate our sponsors for their continuous support. Also, if you're interested in learning more about our sponsors or becoming a member of the African American Marketing Association, visit aa-ma.org.